Well, good day and welcome to this Sunday morning service coming to you from Villiersdorp Community Church in South Africa. My name is Peter de Villiers. Last week we came to the end of our series from Paul's letter to Titus. I'm not starting a new series today. For at least the next three weeks I'll be looking at passages that I believe are important for this moment in history. But they're not part of our normal series where we work through books of the Bible. Now, if you're new here, in the description below you'll find my email address and links to the various online platforms. Follow the links, get to know us a little bit better. Also below you'll find our banking details and if you're blessed by the, this message, perhaps you could consider making a contribution toward our ministry here in Flairstorp and abroad. But now... Let me pray. Lord, as we come to your word today, may we be very conscious of your presence with us. May we submit to your will as you give it to us today from your word. May we be people that strive to honor and glorify you in how we live today and every single day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if we look back over the last 18 months, I'm sure you'll agree with me that we can say with certainty that the last 18 months have been a period during which the levels of uncertainty have reached new heights, at least during my lifetime. And because of these previously unknown levels of life-encompassing uncertainty, there's another thing we can be certain of. And that is the fact that the levels of stress have generally also reached new heights. For instance, what, what stresses me is just how complicated it has become just to go and visit someone. Can, can you remember the, the joy of family and friends that you know would always be eager to see you and you could knock on their door at any time? But now I worry, thinking, what if I have asymptomatic COVID and I infect them? Or the other concern is I may feel it's okay to visit someone, but what if they're scared of having anyone over? If I knock on their door, then perhaps I would be increasing their anxiety instead of making them happy. Or what about people that have lost their jobs in the past 18 months? I mean, here's an article that was published in August. South Africa's unemployment rate is now the highest in the world. This article says that our rate of un unemployment is 44%. That's scary. And then there's the growing concern that, that while COVID vaccines may bring relief to the health systems, COVID is here to stay. What if the way we're living now is what life is going to be like for years? That worries me. And the result of all these worries is devastating. In fact, the South African Society of Psychiatrists, or SASOP, published this article earlier in the year. Mental health is the biggest threat in 2021. Let me quote from the article the, the words of the national convener of SASOP. He writes, With the high levels of grief, uncertainty, stress and anxiety caused by the pandemic, we need to ask ourselves, how does the nation sanitize or protect their minds and build resilience? And as a reflection of this rise in anxiety, I also read an article from a major insurance company which reported that disability claims due to mental health problems, especially depression, have increased dramatically. So to repeat this question we've just heard, how does the nation sanitize or protect their minds and build resilience? But we're Christians, and as Christians, whatever we face, we go to the Bible. And if I were to ask you to mention a passage in the Bible that deals specifically with worries or stress, I'm sure that quite a few of you would point me to Matthew chapter 6. 
So I'm going to look at the passage in Matthew 26 from verse 25 to 34. Now a friend of mine lightheartedly titled this passage, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Now I don't think this is a very accurate heading for this passage. So let's read it and then see what we can learn from it. Matthew 6 from verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, from these verses, I think there are three possible approaches that we can have to in approaching life's stresses and worries. And the first of these I've called the heathen approach to life's stresses and worries. Now, of course, this refers to someone living life in pursuit of life's necessities. I'm sure we can all agree that Food and drink and clothing are real necessities. Without them we'll die. But referring to food and drink and clothing, verse 32 says, For the pagans run after all these things. In other words, that is what they live for. Providing um, in, in everyday needs is what drives them. Now, of course, this cannot be an acceptable approach to life's stresses and worries because Jesus says that this is what the pagans or the heathens do. And we're Christians, not heathens. So, secondly, we then get the religious approach to life's stresses and worries. Now, this approach is about living life, seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And if we do that, then we have this promise in verse 33, which says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things. In other words, these necessities of life like food and drink and clothing, these will be given to you as well. Now, this is the approach that we can get by reading these verses quickly and superficially. And this would have us respond to someone who is struggling with stress and worry. And, and we would say something like this. We would say, don't worry. All you need to do is seek God's kingdom and his righteousness and everything will be all right. But the thing is, anyone who has really been through the mill of life, anyone who in the past 18 months has lost their income or even worse anyone who in the past 18 months has lost a spouse or a parent or a child maybe due to COVID anyone like this will tell you that stress and worry is a little more complicated it doesn't just roll off your back and everything is hunky-dory but then there's the third approach to life's worries and stresses and I've called it Jesus's approach now, of course, by calling it Jesus' approach, I'm already indicating that this is the correct approach. And we get this approach by not 
quickly, just taking the superficial meaning from verse 33, but by reading verse 34 as well, which says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now verse 34 is saying that the problem with worries is that often we focus on the wrong day. Let me explain. As an example, a lumberjack. He has the job of chopping down all the trees in a plantation. And these trees then need to be cut up into certain lengths to fit onto the back of a truck. And he has 12 months to complete the job. Now, he does a calculation and he realizes that if he cuts down 10 trees per day and then cuts these 10 trees into the correct lengths, then the job will be done in 12 months. But to make provision for unforeseen circumstances, he decides to aim for 11 trees per day. But the problem is, he starts on day one. And on day one, he is not worrying about the 11 trees of the day. He is worrying about the 2,860 trees that he still has to chop down. And with every tree that he chops down, his mind is filled with the question, What if? What if I don't finish in 12 months? What if I don't make it? What will happen to my family if I don't then get paid at the end of this 12-month job? So do you see that Jesus is saying that worry is about focusing on the wrong day? Our lumberjack has, has all his thoughts, not even on tomorrow, but, but on 12 months down the line. I mean, what if? What if? And instead of making sure that he gets today's 11 trees chopped down, he worries about 12 months down the line. And living like this is debilitating. It causes stress and anxiety and depression. Now, of course, our lumberjack has to take his responsibilities seriously. And he has to plan and make sure that today's 11 trees are dealt with. Today's 11 trees are his concern for today. But if he's focused on tomorrow and the future, then his concern turns to worry. See, the problem is that you can't do anything about tomorrow's concerns. Tomorrow isn't here yet. Tomorrow doesn't have any handles. So if you try and grab hold of tomorrow, there's nothing to hold on to. And now Jesus says in verse 34, each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, you may have noticed the modern day business principle in these verses. I mean, in planning the way ahead and setting goals, a, a business would get a very expensive business consultant. And he might start with the question, where do you see yourself or where do you see your company in five years and when you reached an agreement on the answer to that question then the next question from the expensive business consultant could be well if this is where you want to be in five years what needs to be done in every one of the five years to get to where you want to be in five years and then the next question is if this is now where you need to be in one year, what do you need to do every month for 12 months to get there? You get the idea. You break your five-year plan down at eventually into weekly and daily minimum required activities. And for this, you have to pay a very expensive business consultant. But Jesus already taught this principle. We can illustrate this with someone going up a staircase, one step at a time. You know, the problem with stress and worries is that it's debilitating. Jesus gives us an example of this in Matthew 25. 
um, you can read it afterwards there. In Matthew 25, we find the parable of the bags of gold, or some translations call it the parable of the talents. But to make a long story short, this master goes on a journey and he entrusts his business interests and his money to three employees. So the first employee, he does some trading and he doubles his master's money. And the second does the same. But the third employee starts worrying. He, he, he starts asking, what if? He knows his master will want to report on what he'd done with the money. And, and because he's so scared that he might lose the money, um, he's scared of the day of his master's return. So he rather takes the money, digs a hole in the ground and buries it in the ground. And of course the master returns and the first and second employees give their report back and the master congratulates them. But when the third employee describes his debilitating fear and how he did nothing, do you remember what the master says? He doesn't say, oh, I'm so sorry that the stress got to you, um, let's organize a psychiatrist for you. No. He says, you wicked, lazy servant. I mean, this man was thinking, what if, what if? And that's what stress does. When you spend all your time thinking, what if? Stressed about the possible failing of an exam instead of doing a bit of studying every day. Stressed about a deadline instead of doing the work for that day. And eventually, worry and stress takes the place of work. I mean, I have a deadline every week. Whatever I do, or whatever I don't do, or whatever happens in the week, Sunday is coming and I have to have a sermon ready for Sunday. And my first target is to do a certain amount of reading on Tuesday morning. And if I don't do that, the week gets to be too short. But even though worrying leads to being unproductive, it's also exhausting. Have you heard people say, I'm just tired all the time and, and I've been to the doctor and he can't find anything wrong with me? Well, perhaps it's stress. Now, you may want to tell me, but this is all good and well. But how does this relate to my spiritual life? I mean, this sounds more like a lecture in business principles or stress management principles. Well, let me get to the next point, which I've called application. And I want to highlight three things. And all these things are spiritual. All of them relate to our spiritual life. First of all, is the fact that being productive honors and glorifies God. You know, to work hard and effectively is God's will. You know, work or being productive didn't come after the fall in Genesis. It became a struggle after the fall. But God gave work and responsibilities to people before the fall. You see, being productive is part of being creative, which is part of God's image in all people. And to allow stress to prevent me from being productive does not honor God. Secondly, focusing on the future also testifies to a lack of trust in God. It testifies to a lack of trust that, that God will bless my work today and that God is my provider for the future. We also see something of this in the Lord's Prayer when he teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. This is actually more practical than we may think and it's very spiritual. See, Jesus knew that our shoulders are broad enough uh, to carry only one day's problems at a time. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Someone who is stressed 
about a possible outcome in the future which may or may not happen. And, and remember, tomorrow doesn't have handles. You can't do anything about tomorrow before you get there. This, this person goes to bed tired, even though he hasn't done anything during the day. And he gets up in the morning tired. The stress doesn't go away. But someone who focuses on today's responsibilities, in other words, someone who grabs the handles of the only day that has handles, namely today, and who then works hard at today's responsibilities and finishes them, this person goes to bed relaxed, tired, but he sleeps well and he, gets, he wakes up in the morning refreshed. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 12 says, the sleep of a laborer is sweet. And then thirdly, some of you may have noticed that I haven't touched on verse 33 yet. The thing is, the person whose focus is on the future, that person's work is never finished. Simply because the work hasn't been broken down into daily manageable responsibilities. And as we've seen, the stress of that is debilitating. But because that person never gets to a point where today's work is done, that person also cannot focus on God's kingdom and his righteousness. You see, only when we have done our daily task and the pressure of work has been released are, are we freed to truly and zealously focus on God's kingdom. And focusing on God's kingdom starts with my own relationship with God. And no relationship is built or maintained without time. And then God's kingdom ex extends to my family. And to build and maintain trusting relationships with, with my wife and my children takes time. And it requires time during which my mind is not distracted by worries about tomorrow. But focusing on God's kingdom doesn't end there with my family. It starts there. Then comes my church family. Every Christian needs the input and support from brothers and sisters in Christ. And if I don't have this, inevitably my focus will again start reverting to the future. And then other Christians in the church family, they need your input and support and edification to keep their focus on today and on God's kingdom and his righteousness. And then there are those that are not yet part of God's kingdom. We are called on to make disciples of all nations. Again, time is required, time during which I'm not distracted by worries about tomorrow. See, without the discipline of managing your time spiritually and mentally and physically and relationally, we will suffer and the church as a body will suffer. And God's kingdom where our primary citizenship lies is also every Christian's primary calling. In the times we live in are not easy. And because of that, it is even more important that, that we heed this practical but, but actually very spiritual discipline of managing our time and really trusting God for tomorrow and for the future. Let me pray. Father God, we come to you at this specific time in world history. It is a time that is very challenging for many of us. But we come to you because you are our God. And we come to you because of the salvation that you give us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We come to you to renew our commitment to you and to your kingdom. And we reaffirm our trust in you as sovereign Lord over world history. We entrust ourselves um, and our future and that of this world into your hands. We know 
that you are working out your plans in this world as, as we head closer to the return of our Lord Jesus. We need your help in this, Lord. We need help in refocusing on today, every day. We need help to discipline ourselves when it comes to how we spend our time. Help us, Father, to prioritize according to your will. Help us to prioritize in a way that clearly shows that we trust in you for tomorrow and for the future. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now as a song for today, I want to invite you to listen to the song Breathe, which comes from Michael W. Smith's new album. The link is in the description below and somewhere next to me on the screen. It's a remake of one of his old songs, but done beautifully. It's a song of worship and devotion. I look forward to sharing with you again from God's Word in a week's time. Same time, same place. So for now, God bless. Goodbye.